From the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for February 2010. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Speciation is the evolutionary process that generates biodiversity. A puzzle for scientists is to figure out how speciation occurs. Occasionally, we can actually watch speciation occur, but in most cases, the change occurs over time periods that we cannot observe. In other cases, scientists want to study speciation that has occurred in the past. So, how do scientists study historical speciation events? We asked Carlos Botero, a postdoctoral fellow at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, to explain his research in the area of speciation. My name is Carlos Botero and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center in North Carolina. Uh, I am a behavioral ecologist and I am interested in the evolution of animal signals of communication. And by that I mean I study the signals that animals use, uh, such as their songs or their coloration patterns, and I try to determine what kind of information they're conveying and how that affects their lives and uh, their behavior. In other words, when Carlos hears a bird singing, he wants to know what that song means to other birds and what happens if the song is slightly different, as in the case of the Galapagos finches in the text story. I study particularly a group of birds called the, uh, called the mockingbirds, which is a group of New World birds that are, that are found all over North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, and um, that, are, that include several really famous species, like the brown thrasher, that is the bird with the largest song repertoire size recorded to date, and the northern mockingbird that is one of those birds that can imitate the songs of any other species in its environment. I enjoy listening to the northern mockingbird's amazing mimicry, but clearly that bird is putting a lot of time and energy into his work. So from a scientific standpoint, why does the bird engage in this energetically expensive behavior? Uh, the importance of song in bird songs, and specifically in a group of birds called the, the, the Ossine passerines, is that it is used primarily to attract females and to deter, and to deter rivals from their own territory. So males, um, the, the males usually are the ones that sing in these groups, and um, what happens is that they use these songs um, in, in a dual purpose way. So with their songs, they're simultaneously interacting with other males, and they're attracting uh, females for future reproductive rep opportunities. It seems we've been studying speciation for a very long time. Why are we still studying speciation 150 years after Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species? The processes that lead to the origin of new species have been a central question in the study of biology ever since Darwin wrote the book on the origin of the species and even before that. Um, and the reason why this question is so important is because we see in the world so many different species with a great diversity of behaviors, of morphology, of um, ways to exploit the habitat, but we need to understand how those different very different approaches to life came about from theoretically a same or, a, or the, probably the same common ancestor. So the processes that make a single lineage diversify or, or break down into different lineages that exploit the environment in slightly different ways and that show slightly different adaptations, morphologies and things like that are incredibly interesting for biologists and could tell us stuff about the world that we live in and how to uh, interact with it better and to protect it in the future. Scientists still use the ideas of natural and sexual selection that Darwin, Wallace, and others outlined over a hundred years ago, but now we have more tools and information to work with. And while this information has confirmed the importance of natural and sexual selection and speciation, the nature of science is such that the more scientists learn, the more questions they have. So rather than settling the question of how speciation occurs once and for all, this new knowledge brings us to more specific questions about the actual mechanisms of speciation. One of the biggest problems when studying speciation is uh, actually getting to observe the whole process. Speciation is a process by which a single lineage gets split into two different lineages and eventually there is some sort of mechanism that generates an isolation uh, and that prevents the two lineages from interbreeding with each other. There are many ways that this can happen. In the black cap example, it's a matter of timing. 
The northern birds pair off at the mating grounds long before the southern birds arrive. In other cases, a population may be physically separated, perhaps by a shifting river or a new road. Behaviors such as changes in song can also prevent interbreeding, and it's this kind of barrier that Carlos studies. Now, that process usually takes some time, and it is not always possible to observe it over time. And in many cases, we actually believe that the time that it takes for the complete process of speciation to take place is extremely long. Uh, under certain conditions, and this is ex exemplified by the studies that are, that are accompanying this podcast, uh, we actually are able to see the process in action, and we are able to see how and what mechanisms were actually involved in breaking apart the lineages and maintaining the reproductive isolation of these lineages and creating the, the actual speciation event. However, in most cases, we, don't, we do not have the luxury of being able to see this process and we have to account for uh, mechanisms in a slightly indirect way. The first step in testing these kinds of ideas is to actually generate a phylogenetic hypothesis, which means basically an idea of how the different species are related to each other. The phylogenetic hypothesis to which Carlos refers is a way of representing the evolutionary history of, in this case, mockingbirds. It's an hypothesis because it's what we think happened based on the information we have currently. But that could change based on new information. Phylogenies can be developed using molecular, fossil, and morphological data. Phylogenies may be changed to accommodate new data, and the more data that's used to build a phylogeny, the more likely it is to accurately represent evolutionary history. In this phylogeny, the tips of the branches represent extant organisms, those that are alive today. Each of the branching points represents a speciation event. By tracing the connections from the tips to the root, which represents a common ancestor, we can travel back through the evolutionary history of mockingbirds. Carlos uses this idea to test behavioral mechanisms of speciation. So as a student of animal communication, I am very interested in understanding whether the changes in the singing behavior of males could have something to do with the speciation patterns that we see in the mockingbirds. And the reason why that could be a possibility is because slight changes in the way that males sing could have important consequences for females recognizing them as part of the same species and thus could create immediately reproductive isolation in the group. So males that sing a song that is weird by the standard of the species may not be able to attract mates and may have problems uh, getting to reproduce over time. So one of the things that we could actually ask using the information contained in the phylogeny is whether changes in the behavior, in the singing behavior of the males had to do or evolved as a function of the speciation events that we see in this group or whether they evolved rather gradually over time. And the way that we can ask this question is the following. What we do is that we collect information on the singing behavior of each of the different species in the group and we quantify it using specific parameters. So for example, in singing, in singing sequences we can see that individuals vary in the number of notes that they sing, that they vary in the number of switches from one type to the other, that they vary in the bandwidth or in the, in the range that they use when they sing, and all these things can be quantified individually. So we could actually measure the number of notes uh, of, of different note types that the individuals produce, and we could measure this for every single species. And we could just come up with a specific number for each species, and so far and so forth. And what we could do is we, cre we could create a model of evolution of these traits, and we could compare two different models. Under one model, we could ask whether the variation that we see in these values has something to do with the number of speciation events that happened from the beginning of the diversification of this family. And in another model, what we could actually ask is whether instead of being a product of speciation, the change actually happened as a function of time. So in this particular case, we would be asking whether it's, it's the time that creates the differences versus the other hypothesis, which is whether it's the speciation events what generates the differences. By comparing the traits of modern bird species to the phylogeny, Carlos is able to test whether a trait has changed slowly regardless of the number of speciation events, 
or if a change parallels speciation events. And this indirect approach has yielded a lot of information about mockingbird speciation. So we've been using this kind of approach to test how or to ask how the different traits in the mockingbirds have evolved. And what we found is that both morphological, ecological, and behavioral traits show distinct patterns of evolution during speciation events. So it seems that a lot of different traits evolved primarily during the moments in which the lineages were branching into two different lineages when the new species were being formed and evolved much less so or did not evolve too much uh, during, the, during the times between speciation events. We've been talking about behaviors of mockingbirds and why they do what they do. How about scientists? Why are you a scientist, Carlos? Well, I actually enjoy a lot of different things about being a scientist. I enjoy being able to go out into the field. I enjoy asking questions about nature and having challenges, trying to, to figure out the proper way to answer them. I enjoy learning different things. I enjoy being able to uh, spend my time thinking about nature. And, uh, and I enjoy the whole process that it's involved in, in exchanging my ideas and in learning from others. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.